World War II is over and the world is being carved up by the victors. Half of Germany and all of Eastern Europe fall under the control of the Soviet Union. The Iron Curtain comes down. America's former ally is now America's enemy as battle lines are drawn in a new kind of war, a Cold War. Most Americans believe a showdown with communism is inevitable. Many also fear that communist spies are infiltrating American institutions and threaten our way of life. Believe me, you communists can't keep fooling the entire world. American politicians begin their assault against communism. I am holding in my hand a microfilm, a very highly confidential secret State Department documents. These documents were fed out of the State Department by communists who were interested in seeing if these documents were sent to the Soviet Union. Lives and reputations are put on the chopping block. From Hollywood to Washington, D.C., from the heartland to Manhattan offices, loyalty becomes an issue. And the question, are you now or have you ever been, is used to probe communist infiltration. I am not and never have been a member of the Communist Party. By 1948, the House on American Activities Committee has already pursued suspected communists for a decade. The most famous witness called before the committee is Alger Hiss. A Harvard graduate, Hiss clerked for Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes and later served as a State Department official and an advisor to President Roosevelt at the 1945 Yalta Conference. In 1948, Hiss is accused of being a Soviet spy. Many are skeptical about his guilt, including President Truman. The reporter said, do you consider these uh, investigations all red herrings? And Truman said, yes. When the House Un-American Activities Committee calls Hiss to testify in 1948, a freshman congressman from California, Richard Nixon, leads the pursuit. I have no apologies to the American people for my part in putting Alger Hiss where he is. Along with Nixon, Hiss's primary accuser is Whitaker Chambers. Mr. Hiss represents the concealed enemy. A Time magazine editor and former communist agent turned informer, Chambers claims Hiss was a member of his old communist cell. In 1950, Hiss is convicted of perjury for lying to a grand jury about knowing Chambers and about passing stolen State Department documents to him. I identified him on several grounds, which I think the record will show. While Hiss is grilled by Congress and a grand jury, government codebreakers are conducting their own investigation. They are hard at work deciphering wartime Soviet secret cables sent between Moscow and its operatives in the U.S. In 1946, they succeed in cracking the Soviet code. The newly deciphered cables are assigned a randomly chosen code name, Venona. And Venona offers disturbing revelations. There are more spies at work in America than previously suspected. So the war years are really the golden age, starting in the 1930s, but the, the, the golden era of Soviet espionage in the United States. The deciphered Venona cables are one of the best kept intelligence secrets of the century. The information is so classified that those who work on them are told by the National Security Agency to keep everyone in the dark, even President Truman. Meredith Knox Gardner was one of those code breakers. That's not my uh, fault. <laughs> uh, I don't know why they did that unless they thought that politicians in general, and especially powerful politicians, whom they couldn't browbeat into swearing that they wouldn't let uh, others know what was going on. I guess they just didn't trust politicians in general. Imagine if today, if an American president was denied access to a vital piece of intelligence information, heads would roll, and correctly so. The Venona cables remain a closely guarded secret for a half century, until 1995 and 1996, when the National Security Agency declassifies most of them. Like a time capsule from another era, the cables tell tales of spies who had infiltrated all aspects of American life. Spies in the State Department, spies in the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, even spies operating inside the top secret Los Alamos lab where the bomb was developed. One young physicist who works in the lab, Ted Hall, passes vital secrets to Russian agents that help the Soviets build their own nuclear weapon. Even though the FBI is on to Hall by 1950, they never arrest him. Exposing him would reveal to the Russians that the U.S. had broken their code. Hall goes free. Ted Hall, who now by his own admission, uh, 
gave the Soviets the most explicit information about the atomic bomb process. Paul was allowed to leave the country, emigrated to Britain, where he became a very successful, prominent scientist. There are other bombshells in the declassified Venona cables. The man who symbolized the so-called Red Witch Hunts, Alger Hiss, is proved to have been a highly placed Soviet spy. Hiss is not only incriminated by Venona, but by a second source as well, damning new evidence found in the archives of the KGB. Alger Hiss was a source for the Soviet military intelligence. It's an absolutely different organization. But in those files, I found a lot of um, documents on Alger Hiss, naming him by his real name. I remember the phrase, with Alger Hiss as a source, one doesn't need anyone else. In 1994, Officials in Moscow no longer have any reason to protect the secrets of the Stalinist era. They decide to open portions of the KGB archives so that a history of Soviet espionage can be written for the first time. American historian Alan Weinstein joins with journalist and former KGB agent Alexander Vasiliev to examine the files. I am the first person who did any research in the archives. No one including uh, people who were giving me the files. No one knew what was there. And uh, I found there are a lot of things which they didn't want me to find. Weinstein and Vasiliev embark on a remarkable journey of discovery. Each new file offers detailed information about Americans who collaborated with Moscow. The revelations in the KGB files also mirror the startling disclosures contained in the Venona documents. It's a bonanza from a historian's point of view. It's more than the famous Watergate two-source rule. It's the same source from their archives and from our archives. Uh, could I have expected any of that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The KGB files reveal startling details about Americans who spied for Moscow. But who were these people, and what drove them to spy for the communists? Most were motivated by high ideals, others by love, and in one case, just plain greed. We go back to America in the 1930s. The Great Depression causes widespread unemployment. Many believe capitalism has failed. It's a fertile time for communism, and Moscow is looking for agents. People sympathetic to the cause, but who are not communists. Such people wouldn't be under suspicion and might penetrate to the highest levels of American society. One such man, however, is not a recruit, but rather a volunteer. Samuel Dickstein, born in Lithuania, is six when he is brought by his family to the United States in 1891, part of the vast tide of turn-of-the-century immigration. He rises through the political ranks of New York's Democratic Party, and in 1922, he is elected to the United States Congress. He is still serving his New York district during the most desperate days of the Depression. And this was a a uh, Democrat from uh, New York City, a uh, Russian immigrant himself, Russian Jewish immigrant family, with uh, anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of uh, America either unemployed or underemployed, with poverty as widespread as it was, with uh, the rise of Adolf Hitler in Germany, uh, which was felt with special sensitivity by the immigrant Jewish population, uh, so much of New York. Uh, there was an especially fertile ground for the development of radical support organizations. This is the world Congressman Dickstein comes from. His constituents are primarily immigrants, refugees from political strife in Europe, and by the mid-30s, the political strife they are escaping is primarily fascist. The man was known as a person whose specialty was immigration, chaired the immigration committee in the House, but had his claim to fame was to have started the House process that led to the House on American Activities Committee. In 1934, Dickstein gains House approval for this special but temporary committee. Dickstein is appointed vice chairman, and John McCormick of Massachusetts is appointed chairman. During its first year, Dickstein tries to keep the committee focused on American Nazi sympathizers, but other members broaden the scope to include communists in America. 
We are organizing an army of the liberation of the people. KGB file number 15428. It is Samuel Dickstein's file, and it reveals one of the greatest ironies in the history of espionage. Samuel Dickstein, the man who created the House Un-American Activities Committee, becomes a paid agent of Soviet intelligence. But a greater surprise was that, unlike most of the people who spied, who engaged in intelligence work for the Soviets during the 1930s and 40s, most of the Americans, uh, who were uh, motivated by anti-fascism, by belief in communism. Dickstein did it for the money. It, it surprised me that no one inside the intelligence knew about this fact, but it didn't surprise me that some politician did such a thing. When former KGB agent Alexander Vasiliev first comes across Dickstein's file, he finds a description of an audacious, unscrupulous man who had one thing on his mind when he walked into the Soviet embassy in Washington, D.C. on December 20th, 1937. And uh, said that I could help you with spying on uh, Russian fascist organizations in America, but you will have to pay me. And uh, he was asking for five or six thousand dollars a month, and they began bargaining. You know, as a former operative of the Soviet intelligence, I can't imagine myself bargaining with a U.S. congressman about, about payment. But they did it, and uh, they actually agreed on uh, 1250 dollars a month. For that price, Representative Dickstein tries to provide anything the Soviets might be interested in. We have a list of various items he passed, which would have been including uh, government internal budgets on how much the U.S. was spending on, on uh, military issues. Uh, there are a whole bunch of government documents that he is supposed to have passed, according to the files. But in this pre-World War II period, the Russians want Dickstein to investigate anti-Soviet groups in the United States. Dickstein was much happier spying on fascist groups or on monarchist groups for them. One of the things about the Soviet intelligence is they never stopped focusing on the tiniest of the remaining monarchist groups supporting a restoration of the monarchy in uh, the Soviet Union, nor did they stop focusing on Leon Trotsky supporters, also a small band, even after they had assassinated Trotsky. Russian intelligence recognizes a golden opportunity when it learns that Dickstein's temporary anti-fascist committee will gain permanent congressional status as a standing committee. In what must rank as one of the boldest and most ambitious espionage ideas of the 20th century, Moscow directs Dickstein to gain control of the committee so he can use it to serve Russian ends. Uh, the idea was that he would steer away the investigation away from the communists and channeled uh, to pro-Nazi, pro-German elements in, uh, in uh, the United States. That was the paramount idea about Samuel Dickstein. It was big political game. They wanted him to, to influence the U.S. Congress in this direction. However, Moscow's plans are thwarted in 1938 when a coalition of conservative Democrats allied with Republicans takes control of the House. The liberal Dickstein fails to even gain a seat on the new committee. His failure is a severe disappointment to his handlers. So is his greed. He had very negative uh, image in the eyes of the Soviets because the Soviets at the time were working with people ideologically inclined. The code name for American sources 